Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. I, uh, my wife having that spill, it was very hard on me because I was in Greenville, and she was up at the, the wilds at our little chalet we stay in there. And But I praise the Lord, her daughter was there. And uh, we had uh, nurses there that were right on top of it. Before she even left for the hospital, uh, they had guys in there cleaning the blood off the floor. And, and uh, it, uh, but uh, God's God's good. We, uh, my wife is a year older than I am. But when I turned, when I was 79, uh, before I turned 80, I always felt I was um, younger than I was. You know, I always felt, you know, working with young people, and, you know, I'm not 79, I'm not almost 80, but when I turned 80, I feel like I'm older than I really am. <laughs> it's, uh, everything seems to be falling apart, but uh, we rejoice in God's goodness. And along that line, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 13, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I may have preached this before, but I bet you you don't remember it because I don't remember if I did or not. <laughs> Numbers chapter 13. We'll start out by reading verses 30 and 31. And then we'll go into an explanation of it. Numbers 13, verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We will not be we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now here is the story. The children of Israel had come through the Red Sea, they'd spent two years in Mount Sinai, and God gave them to Moses the law. And then they marched up to the city of Kadesh Barnea. Now that's a city just outside the southern borders of Palestine. And uh, when they were there, uh, Moses uh, said uh, to them in verse chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, uh, but the people were concerned. I mean, they've never, these folks were in Egypt for 430 years. Not those folks, but the generations were. And they, they hadn't been there into Palestine, and they were concerned. And so God granted that they would be able to send some folks in there. So chapter 13, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, notice that sentence, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler or a leader among them. And Moses, by the command of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And he names them. They were the chief leaders of the twelve tribes. You notice Caleb's in there, and Hoshea, which is Joshua. And uh, th they all went, and it tells us that they would go up to the mountain. He told them, go up to the mountain so you can look at the land, and then go through the whole land. And then it tells us in verse 25, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. So here's 12 leaders. These weren't just folks that didn't have any uh, leadership ability. And they, they had, should have had some common sense and all that. But here's 40 days. They saw the same thing. They experienced the same people. They went through the whole land. And they cut down some uh, grapes, grapes and eshkel. And they brought back this big grape. Uh, two people had to carry it on sticks. And to show that there was a fruitful place. And in fact... That image of two men carrying on a stick the grapes, this big hunk of great grapes, is the motto and the logo of the Department of Tourism of the state of the country of Israel. Now, so here they come back home, 
and they wanted to give a report. And it tells us that the, uh, you, you, you see this, it says, we're not able to take this land. Ten of them, the majority of these leaders said, we cannot, it's impossible. We are not able to, to uh, overcome these people. Now, two of them said the opposite thing. Well, we're well able. Let's go get them. Now, what would be the difference? When they all saw the same thing, they experienced the same uh, uh, activities, they talked to the same people, and ten of them said, we're not able. Two of them said, we're well able. What was the difference in their report? I suggest to you that the difference in their support, their report, was their focus. F-O-C-U-S. That is, what did they really see? The focus of their heart. What were they looking for? Uh, what was the, the very thing that would, uh, uh, th what they were seeing from their heart? What did those folks see that said, we're not able? Well, what they were seeing was the problems. They were all shook up about the problems. You see, Moses told them, he said, we, we go into that land and, and go back to verse uh, uh, 17 of chapter 13. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak or few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether they, it be a good or bad, and what cities uh, be, uh, there be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye good, of good courage, and, and bring forth the fruit of the land. Now it was the time of the first ripe grapes. Now notice Moses' leadership. He doesn't say, just go out and look at it and come back and give a report. He gave him specific instructions. Good leadership gives instructions. If you're a parent and you're telling your kid to do something, give him instructions. If you're a boss, don't just take for granted that people know what to do. Moses showed a real characteristic of leadership. You give a person a t job and you make sure they know what to do and how to do it. So what they, uh, what they uh, did was to find out whether they're strong people, whether they're weak, uh, whether there was a lot of them, what's the demographics, uh, did they have security in the fact that they lived in tents, or were they in established homes? Uh, uh, were they living in open village or walled cities? Did they have protection and, sa and safety? Uh, look at this place. Uh, is it a good place to live? Is it good or bad, he said. You know, there's some places that are bad places to live. Uh, was it uh, uh, a place that was fat or lean? That is, was there resources? Uh, was there wood or no wood? Was there building materials? Uh, is this a place to bring over two million people into, is what he's saying. Uh, was there fruit or no fruit? Is there productivity? To, does, does the ground grow food that would help us? And so they had all the the ingredients of the questions that they were to come back and report the answers to. And they were there for 40 days. But what did the majority, the majority of people say, we're not able? There's no way. Why? Because they were looking at the problems. The problems was the thing that was captivating their focus. How can we take this land? Look at these people. They are strong people. And in fact, uh, if you notice it, what it says in uh, verse 31, the men that went up with them said, we be not able to go up against them for they are stronger than we. I mean, they have, they have weapons of war and all this. Uh, there are warring people. Verse 32, it says, uh, we go in there. Uh, and it's a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. They were men of war. They were going to eat them up, and there were giants there. In verse 33, and we saw the giants, the son of Anak, 
which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. These giants looked at us as if we were just grasshoppers that we could smash. And they said, that's the way we felt. We, we felt like we were just grasshoppers, just uh, little things compared to these giants. There's no way we can take this way, place. Uh, look at the problems of taking the land and trying to maintain it because they're stronger and they're warring people and, and they're giants there. And look at the walled cities, verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And then you look at the topography. When you think about this, look at verse 29. The Amalites dwelt in the land of the south. And the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwelt in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwelt by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. I mean, there were people everywhere in the mountains, in the valleys, in the sea coast, everywhere. We're not able to take this land. There's no way we're going to be able to get a look at this topography. Now, when you go to Israel, it's very interesting. Uh, you have several cities uh, that are, imp uh, you can't penetrate them. You've got the Golan Heights. I mean, that is such a vital part to give protection to Israel even today. There's all the fighting's been over that uh, because uh, it's just right there's Lebanon, the Syria, and boy, they can send things all over the bombs and all these Scud missiles and all. And, and then you've got Ramah, R A M A H. It's a hill right outside Jerusalem. In fact, in recent years, uh, before, uh, back in the 40s when they were re-populating uh, Israel with Jews, the Jordanians were sitting up there with all kinds of guns and weapons and stuff, and they were shooting down right on, trying to keep the people from coming to Jerusalem. Uh, go on the other side. We were, went up this horrible road, which uh, uh, has all kind of landmines from, uh, from that era. And uh, there's only one driver that the, the guide would allow to take them up there. It was a, you had to stop and back up around these curves. We got up there and there's machine guns and all kinds shooting down on the Jordan River and the people there. And then, then of course, you've got uh, Megiddo. I mean, <laughs> that's where the big battle of Armageddon is going to be. I mean, it is a narrow mountain and the, uh, and the Bible tells us that there's going to be in the, in the battle of Armageddon, a blood running to the bridles of the horses. Very difficult, very difficult to take that land. You come into from the south, we were in a city called Arad, A-R-A-D, and, and you look out there and all you see is desert. And my wife jokingly said, you know, I, looking out at that desert, I don't know, maybe I'd be one of those gripers about all the places we are. Because it's a, I mean, it is barren. Very difficult to occupy Israel. These people said, we are not able because of all these things. Because of their strength, their military uh, uh, help and uh, the, the giants there and the walled cities, how are we going to take them? And how do you get in with all this topography like it is? It's almost a fortress, just the land itself. We're not able. What was the result of their focusing on the problems? What was the result of them focusing on how they would take that land? Well, immediately, it was very interesting that chapter 14, verse 1, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and they cried and people wept that night. There was a depression, a sorrow that came in. And in verse 2, and the people, the children of Israel, murmured against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? And would God we had died in this, uh, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Now, folks, they place blame on Moses and Aaron, these people, these good leaders who had no vision for God. They were looking at it strictly from their abilities. We cannot take this land. 
And as a result of this, they wept, they got depressed, they were gripers, complaining, placing blame. Uh, they, they turned against God's men. They turned and murmured against Moses and Aaron. In verse 3, Wherefore hath the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children would be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And so then it led to them turning against God himself. And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt, where they were slaves. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were with them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, Land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Here's two men, the minority, that uh, said, we are going, we need to take this. We're well able to take this land. Why are you folks griping? Why are you folks uh, not having faith? Uh, why are you in despair and depressed and griping and place and blame and, and almost hopelessness? You know, the 40 days that those uh, spies were in that land became 40 years of wandering. I mean, it tells us, it won't take time to look at it, but there's a passage over in chapter 14, it just says that. So every, uh, well, it's uh, uh, verse 34. After the number of days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day four years, shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. You see, these folks started to wander in the wilderness and... The command was given by God, not one of you that is 20 years of age and over will enter into the promised land. And they died in the wilderness. And it's very interesting. The children that these 10 folks were so concerned about being a prey uh, to the Canaanites, they're the only ones that went in. Plus, Caleb and Joshua. Even Moses, because of his impetuousness, and because he violated God's command, died before they went over the Jordan into the land. And Joshua became the leader. They never realized the promised land. Do you know in the Bible, Israel, Palestine is called the promised land? Why? Why? Why would it be called the promised land? Any answers? Because it was promised by God to them. That's why we call it the promised land. God said there in chapter 13, verse 2, in the land which I will give to you. In fact, you go way back where Moses was in, uh, in the wilderness keep, keeping sheep and there was a, a bush there that was burning and it wasn't being consumed. God said, take your, t take your shoes off. You're on holy land. I want you to go down to Egypt and deliver my people from Egypt and, and take them to the land that I will give to them. These folks were not focusing on who their God was. He did not, they did not focus and said we're not able. They didn't focus on what God said He would do. What He promised. Well, then we read in their chapter 13, again to our text verse, uh, verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. You see, the difference is, in verse 31, the t ten leaders said, we're, we're not able to go up against the people. They're stronger than we are. They were right. There was no way. That Israel, not with organized armies, by themselves and their strength, could take that land. Impossible. They were right. Why? Because they were relying upon their strength. 
They were relying upon their uh, army. They were relying upon their resources. They focused on things of themselves and their abilities and not upon God. So now look at what Caleb and uh, Joshua said. We are well able to overcome it. We can get we can get victory. We go. Let's go. Kind of like the uh, uh, the day of our uh, 9/11. What was it? Uh, the folks in the plane said, "Let's roll. Let's roll." And those folks, those men, uh, when they, they they took over that that plane, kept it from hitting the Pentagon, saved more lives even though they all died out in the fields of Pennsylvania. And that's what they're saying. Let's go. Let's go. We are well able to take this land. Why? Because notice what they focused on. They focused on the promises of God. Look, if you will, at verse 8. If, that word is, since the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us. A land that floweth with milk and honey. They focused on the fact that God would do what he said he would do. God will give us the victory. We can't do it, but God will do it because he promised it. Like another illustration in the Bible, you think about this. God promised that Abraham would be the father of a great nation. His wife was barren. She was old, older than to, too old to bear children. He was old as well. He was a hundred years old. And so, you know, they manipulated around, took some of their concubines and all that. Les Ola says the cucumbers <laughs> and does, and. Uh, uh, had uh, Hagar had, had a child born that became the father of the Arabs which is the great bitter enemy of course of, of Israel took things in their own hands and it didn't work just like those that focused on their strength and said we can't do it it didn't work Abraham was told after he learned some lessons that God was able to keep his promises. Can you imagine this? When Sarah did bring forth a son, she, she rejoiced. God said, I want you to take this boy, this boy of promise, and I want you to go up to Mount Moriah, which is where the temple is now, or has been. And I want you to take some wood with you. Take a, a light so you have uh, f fire on a stick. And you go up there and I want you to kill him. I want you to sacrifice him on the altar of sacrifice. Abraham immediately arose the next morning, went there. They started to go up the mountain and left the, uh, his servants down the lope below. And Isaac said, Father, we've got the wood and we've got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And he went through the whole thing. I mean, he was going to do what God told him. And he, and, and he, now, now, why they did sacrifices, we always think about this. Actually, they would slit their juggler vein. And he had the knife, and he was ready to cut his son's vein and sacrifice him because God commanded him to do it. And God stopped him. And God had a substitute. There was a ram over in the thicket that he sacrificed instead of his son. Why did God do that? Tested his faith. Do you really believe that I will fulfill my promise? 
that this son of yours will be certainly the continuing of your whole family upon the earth. And that's what these folks had. They had that faith to believe in a great God. You know what the problem is, some of us? We have a very low estimate of God. We don't believe that, that, that He can do what He says He can do. And when a person gets bitter, it's usually because he has a low view of God. God, you cheated me. God, you didn't, you didn't do what you said you would do. You're not big enough to take care of me. And they focused on the promises of God. He will give it us. But notice verse 9, further, of chapter 14. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. Now wait a minute. What did the ten say? They're going to eat us up. They'll destroy us. Why? They focused on the problems and the people in the land, the circumstances around them, the people they're with. Oh, if, only, if we only had this and only had that. How many times we say, boy, if we just had different neighbors or if we just had different this or different that. If we just had some money. if That's what they were doing. But he said, we are going to focus on the power of God. His promises are sure. Hey, He's the God who created us. Nothing is impossible with Him. He's the one who saves us. He's the one that raised His Son Jesus from the dead. He's the one who healed my mother from cancer. This was before they have all the things they have now. And I have a daughter right now who's had double mastectomy. My mother had one in 1952. And I saw the elders of the church, according to the book of James, lay hands upon her, anoint her with oil, and her hands, she could never raise any higher than my hands right now. She had to exercise trying to get her arms up to do some uh, work on those um, uh, nodes under her. Uh, the, the stitches were 28 inches of stitches on her body when they finished massacring her, my, my mother's body. And when they laid their hands on her, her hands shot up like that. And she lived another 60 years after that. God's a good God. He's able. He's powerful. He fulfills His promise. He is able with His power. And we focus on the power of God. And those folks that will eat them like bread, their defense will be departed from. When you think about the defense, walls departing from those folks that lived in Israel. What incident do you think of? Jericho. I mean, the walls didn't fall out, they fell in. What was the battle strategy? March around the city, blowing the trumpets with the... And those trumpets were not the call to war, those trumpets were the call to worship. And they marched around once a day for six days, seven times the seventh day, and they blew their horns and they shouted, and the walls fell down. Their defenses departed from them. And they focused on the power of God to do what He said He would do and followed Him and obeyed Him. Now, the next time, they didn't even talk to God about what to do. They went to this little city of Ai, oh, we need, only need 3,000 soldiers, and 30 of them got killed. And they were defeated. Joshua fell on his face before God and God said, now here's how you're supposed to do it. Let me guide the battle. Let me be the one that gives you the battle strategy. Focusing on the power of God. One of the most exciting things to me is in verse 9. The last part. He said, and the Lord is with them. Fear them not. You see, these two men, Caleb and Joshua, the only two of those leaders that entered into the promised land, focused out of their heart on the promises of God, on the power of God, and on the presence of God. 
There was a time Moses would not go up uh, with to, to battle uh, uh, if God wouldn't go with him. God says, if you do that, I'm not going to go with you. And then Moses says, I'm not going either. What is the, what is the trite statement? Go with God. That doesn't mean too much to the people. Who use it. Let's go with God. It's a lot more than just some kind of an external thing. It's a focus of your heart, of your life. He's with us always to the end of the age. I'll never leave you, nor forsake you, regardless of your circumstances, regardless if it looks impossible, regardless if it hurts. He says, I'm with you. God is with us. So let's fear God. Let's live in reality of who He is and not fear man. When we live in reality of God's promises and His power and His presence and His performances, why do we worry? Why do we fret? Why do we waver? Why do we allow circumstances and experiences to defeat us and to get us all down and depressed? Start blaming everybody else and blaming God. You see, verse 11 said, The Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have shown among them. When, when things go wrong, this is where the praise principle comes in. Start Praising God. Look back at what He has done and what He is doing in your life and quit griping and complaining about how you feel. It's not a woe is me. It's a fact that God, the praise person, my, my mentor is Dr. Walt Fremont who was the dean of education of Bob Jones. We prayed for 10 years that God would give us a camp in the southeast. For 22 years he lived after he was uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's, uh, with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Wrote two and a half books during that time. I think I told you that I'd walk into his bed and he was all, he couldn't get out of bed, he was feeding, in, feeding fed through tubes and he couldn't talk, but there's one word you could understand. You walk in his room and he'd see it and he'd go, Oh, He was praising God, even though he was very, very much an invalid. These folks said, God said, look, or, or uh, Caleb and Joshua said, look what God's already done. Look what God's already done. Why? He, he came, he, the miracle of a burning bush, Moses with ten plagues. Uh, deliverance from the land. We're out there at the Red Sea. We can't go forward. And, and, and the army's coming behind us. The Egyptian army. The, the Pharaoh changed his mind. What's God do? He takes the cloud that's leading him and puts it between them and the soldiers. And those soldiers in their chariots didn't have lights on them, you know. And so they had to stop and st for the night. But it was daylight. And on the other side of that cloud... Here God opened up the Red Sea and they walked through on dry land. But then when, when they got on the other side, God opened up the, the, the cloud and uh, here comes the Egyptian army and their wheels come out in the mud. Come off. Water comes down and drowns the army. Look what he's done. Their shoes didn't wear out. I don't know what they did with children as they grew during that 40 years. <laughs> I guess leather stretches <laughs> but they, they God whoa there's no water strike the rock water and I believe personally that rock went with them the rock that followed them it's a sample of Christ it gives us living water and that's why Moses got in trouble God said smite it smite it again he hit it or, or talk to it and he hit it and he disobeyed God and so he didn't get to go to the promised land but folks, think about it. 
God revealing Himself to them on Mount Sinai. Think about what God's done. My advice to you is when things go wrong, whether you feel like it or not, start praising God. Start praising God. Look at what He's done. God led us in a wild situation in the camp. I directed camps for 15 years before we started the wilds. And, and we didn't go to people and said, uh, say, uh, hey, look, this is what we're going to do. Come on. We were able to say, look what God's already done. Look what God's already done. He's done this and this and this in, in a, a period of 10 years of praying. This is what God has done. And God gave success. Folks, what's your focus? What do you, what do you really dwell on? Your strength? Uh, your rights? Your ambitions? Do, do we really stop and ask God, now what do you want me to do about this? Lord, you, uh, you, you promised to give victory. You promised to use us to get people to the Lord. You promised to guide us and to direct us and to grow us spiritually. And you have all power. All authority was given to Jesus Christ. And he said, you go. You preach the gospel. You win people to the Lord. You disciple them in the faith. There is nothing too hard for our God. Can you focus on that? Can you live in reality of that? We are well able to destroy the impossible. Two of them, they entered. <laughs> and uh, here uh, Caleb was 80 years of old age and he says, I want that mountain. He wanted Hebron. They call it Hebron over there. I want that mountain. Oh, well, that's where all the giants live. I've got a God who's promised us the land. I've got a God who's got the power to give victory. I've got a God who has given us performance up to this point. Uh, I've got a God that will go with me. And he conquered them. And lived in the land. Folks, what were the results? These folks, because they focused on who God was, not only got into the land, but God gave them victory. They possessed it. The promised land in the Bible is a place of rest. There's a spiritual impact there, a spiritual interpretation there. You see, they entered into the land, they possessed the land, and they defeated the enemy. Now, when we were a kid, we sang songs like, uh, My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. Any of you remember singing that? All I have to do is follow. Now, down south, all I have to do is follow. But, uh, hey, God did not intend you and me to be wandering in the wilderness. Spiritually, He intends for us to be in a place uh, of bountiful joy and fruit. He wants us to be living in the promised land with joy and peace. Resting in Him. The living reality of who He is. I cannot challenge you enough. May Holy Spirit use it in our lives. In my life. Live in reality of the fear of God. Not fearing man. The ten died. It tells us that God killed them. And uh, they, they never saw the land. And God struck them dead. Even those men, verse 37, chapter 14, that did bring up the evil report upon the land, died by the plague before the Lord. 
God's serious. He wants us to rest in Him. He wants us to live in the promised land. That's not heaven. We sing songs about uh, crossing over Jordan and going to heaven. Man, the real war began when they got into the promised land. But God was with them. God was powerful. God performed miracles. The battles, you read the Old Testament, the battles were won not because of the power of the Israeli army, but because of the power of God. And I encourage you, focus. Turn your eyes of your heart to who our God is. And quit wasting our energy, moaning, groaning, griping, complaining, because there's stronger people out there. Satan is there and all his demons. And now we see in the day and the culture we're living in, it seems like Satan's having the victory. I stood up here and told you what I thought concerning uh, the Sodomites, which is sin, which is evil. God condemned Sodom and Gomorrah. God said that some of the cities that he, uh, Christ said some of the cities he were in, they were worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Somebody's spy here for the government would turn me in and I'd be put in jail for bullying, not having, uh, not having love for these people. Yeah, we're in a tough time. But let's quit worrying about how tough it is and get out busy living in reality who our God is. Father, I pray you use this. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.